Hello, Peter. Hi, Joe. I can hear you now. I had a little. Oh, list there. Okay. It wasn't well, your fault. Well, that's all right. <laughs> well, that's really good to know. Uh, that exonerates me then. Um, <laughs> Peter, you, I don't know if you, uh, I saw you peeking in once in a while that you may have heard some of our conversation with um, Jose Rivera down in Ecuador. Yes, and I did. Earlier with Ray McGovern. And at the top of the hour, of course, we gave the news, which we could recap very quickly that this imminent, imminent threat to Julian Assange's freedom seems to have passed because hmm. the, according to Jose, um, it backfired on him very much. The leak, whoever these two Ecuadorian government officials were that told WikiLeaks that there would be an imminent expulsion of Assange seems to have worked in that it stopped it from happening because it brought an outcry in the public and uh, they blew the plans essentially. Uh, we have that that live feed of Rupley there, which we were just showing, constantly uh -huh. focused on the embassy. It looked like a guy was delivering a pizza there. I hope he wasn't some kind of undercover guy. But um, and <laughs> um, this may have passed. And then Jose said something very disturbing that uh, if Moreno goes, and it looks like he, his departure may be imminent within hours or days, uh, that a guy called Otto would take over as uh, president, he's the current vice president, from the Christian Socialist Party, which is even more anti-Assange than Moreno is, and mm -hmm. would perhaps put more pressure on him. So just uh, give me your your views of what's been happening in the last day, well, last four hours. First, Joe, I have been relying on Consortium News, and I want to thank you for great coverage this week. Uh, Elizabeth Voss uh, gave us... <laughs> Chloe, I'm busy. That's I think goal. Chloe agrees, agrees with you about Elizabeth's piece, yeah. <laughs> Well, Elizabeth's article, which helped us understand the domestic issues in Ecuador that appeared to be driving uh, this bus, uh, I described it as Trump tactics, that Moreno was using big lies, uh, distractions, and diversions. And when he blamed uh, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, and not Juan Guaido, uh, <laughs> I knew he was fishing, uh, you know, with a, a pretty long line. And so uh, you've given us great context for uh, these developments. And last night you alerted us to uh, the WikiLeaks tweet and then uh, Mrs. Assange's uh, messages. And so I, I just want to express my gratitude for the great coverage that you've been offering. And, uh, you know, we, we are seeing that Trump's posture as an openly corrupt, uh, you know, wheeler dealer kind of leader is being seized upon by other corrupt would be wheeler dealers. Uh, and I believe that Julian Assange is now a commodity. And whether it's Moreno or Otto, uh, you know, I do fear that Ecuador will seek to cash in. Uh, you know, they were originally asking for debt relief. Uh, Moreno may need, need to move to Baby Doc's place in uh, the south of France. I'm sure the CIA has a, a villa rented for him somewhere. And uh, so part of this we've seen before, <laughs> and part of it is kind of uh, you know newly developed to address the unusual nature of WikiLeaks and the work that Assange has been doing. So I see this, even if the imminent threat has passed, this is an important moment where we need to recognize that the, particularly in the United States, the media outlets that uh, uh, you know, used WikiLeaks materials, uh, profited from them, uh, have now turned and, you know, they're more interested in siding up to the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, they're not explicitly, in my view, trying to help Trump, but, you know, their view is that Assange and WikiLeaks are expendable that uh, whatever utility they've had is uh, something that, uh, you know, doesn't produce any loyalty or even uh, principled responses. 
So, you know, the, the, there was a brief post at the Washington Post today citing the British Foreign Secretary with a, a quote that doesn't help us much. The Foreign Secretary, you probably saw this, says that uh, Julian Assange is a free man and suggested that he can walk out of that embassy at any moment. Now he doesn't, the, the, either the, he, he said more and the post didn't quote it or he didn't say more and left that for people to chew on. But fundamentally, you can't trust the British government that when uh, Julian's foot hits the sidewalk, uh, that they won't round him up and immediately uh, extradite him to the United States. Well, the British um, Defense Secretary said maybe a year ago or within the last year that the moment he does that, the British police will give him a warm welcome. So this line that he's free to go is the one they keep pushing. Not only the British Foreign Secretary, but many people in this country, in the U.S., Democrats saying, hey, why doesn't he just go? Well, yeah. I mean, if you were uh, in your house and you knew that the moment you stepped out, state police were going to get you, Peter, uh, for something you didn't do and that you could face the rest of your life in jail and the house that you're staying in, you were there invited as a guest to stay as long as you wanted uh, to protect you. But then a new owner bought the house. Now they want you out. That's pretty much the situation you're in. That doesn't change the fact that he's not a free man to go outside, even to go to the hospital to get checks, uh, medical tests that he needs, apparently from mm -hmm. his doctors to say that they cannot do in the embassy. He's still mm -hmm. not going out. Why? Because I've heard that him called a coward when he's actually one of the most courageous men uh, around right now, at least that we know of, yes. for what he's done and for sticking this out. And for telling the Ecuadorian ambassador last week, according to Cassandra Fairbanks, that he's an agent of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's what he's told the new owners of his house. <laughs> well, uh, you know, this, this is all part of a bigger piece. Uh, the, you know, insertion of Maduro into uh, Moreno's litany of complaints suggests to me that he is trying to accentuate that he's part of the Lima group, this instantly formed entity uh, led by Canada. Uh, a lot of people, you know, think that Justin Trudeau is a, a cute and lovable guy. Uh, and Canada, probably at the behest of the United States, uh, formed the Lima group because the Organization of American States will not turn, at least not uh, in a majority, on Maduro. And so this then becomes part of the regime change effort in Venezuela. And uh, it puts Moreno and Ecuador on the side of the United States, which they feel will uh, accrue to their benefit. And uh, it, it really is a race to the bottom. Uh, away from constitutional standards and international norms. And uh, if I may, I want to take a little swipe at the VIPS memo Please. that you published this week. You're free to say whatever you want. Well, I, I appreciate that they weighed in and that they advised the president uh, not to get sucked into Venezuela. And perhaps it was diplomacy uh, that uh, left out uh, certain critical parts in the VIPS memo, but uh, they didn't mention that Maduro is the legitimate leader of Venezuela, that the claims of the, uh, you know, uh, election that didn't have integrity last year, uh, nobody has any evidence of that. They, you know, the Guaido opposition boycotted that election and then turned around and complained that they didn't win. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've talked with Dan Kavalik, who was one of the international observers of the Venezuelan election last May, and I find him quite credible. And I think that the Venezuelan election was more legitimate than the 2016 election in the United States. And, you know, I don't buy into the Russian meddling uh, scenarios. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, Many of the points in the memo were, were on target and accurate, but I felt that 
in some ways, maybe the effort was to persuade the president. And that seems kind of silly to me. <laughs> I, I mean, well, I'm glad you published the memo. I just think that to pull punches, uh, hoping that he might actually listen to this advice is, you know, not wise. Well, uh, I wish Ray was on or you were on when Ray was on because Ray is uh, one of the leaders of VIPs, of course. And mm -hmm. I Consortium News has been the depository of their memos since they started back in 2002, I think, just before the debunking the WMD story about Iraq, which gave the credibility to VIPs that they've enjoyed. Uh, we don't, I don't edit those uh, memos in any way at all, except maybe for mm -hmm. grammatical facts. It's not like an article that appears in consortium. It is simply a place where we publish the memos. So I mm -hmm. personally take, you know, on really no stand on either one. And if there's something in there I don't agree with, I don't have anything to say about it. Uh, so your criticisms are welcome. You should have Ray on your show. Uh, ask him to come on and talk about it. I think he'll yeah. do it. He'll mm -hmm. defend that. But it's interesting yeah. that they, yeah, that, um, Moreno called on, said Maduro was involved here. So he's kind of legitimizing him and still the president. I th like you said, I thought he thought that Guaido was the president. <laughs> but that's an absurd uh, accusation, really, that somehow WikiLeaks had hacked these personal pictures of his that wound up, and Jose wound up uh, being published of his family living it up large in an apartment in Geneva, Switzerland. So the... Uh, the story is that uh, that was part of these INA papers that were leaked by the opposition party, according to Jose, uh, to destroy Moreno because he never delivered on a hydroelectric plant in their district. It's that kind of local crap that now is blown up into a major international issue because he dragged Assange into this as a way to deflect attention and falsely said that WikiLeaks had published these so-called INA papers when that was not the case at all they were hand delivered in hard copies to a member of the parliament who made it public uh, that he had them and then started this investigation and marino may be gone in a matter of days uh mm -hmm. and he had to back off because of the, somebody in the government uh leaked uh, this to wikileaks that there would be an imminent expulsion and, and, and joe uh, i believe this remains exclusive to consortium news because you know i survey the media every day i have not seen uh any coverage of moreno's claims uh and assange's uh reaction and the heightening tensions there in london well cnn had a story this morning did they yeah, it's saying that the government backed off or that they said it wasn't true. And the Ecuadorian press, as Jose showed us, was saying these are unfounded rumors. Um, it doesn't seem likely. It seems WikiLeaks was accurate in reporting what two sources in the Ecuadorian government, high level, as they claimed, uh, mm -hmm. had said. So, um, no, some people think. There was one commenter on that story uh, in consortium that we are again, you know, crying wolf and it's a mistake to be alarmist about this. Well, you know, this was WikiLeaks call. They decided to publish that tweet uh, quoting one Ecuadorian high level official and we subsequently learned it was another. Uh, and that's serious. I don't think WikiLeaks would have come out with that if they didn't believe that. Uh, and that's obviously news. And uh, they had to back down because it didn't work for mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Uh, Moreno. Yeah. <laughs> because I think because the plan was was exposed. Mm -hmm. So uh, everyone's looking for this to happen now, for Assange to be spirited out of that place. And um, for now, it looks like we're sitting uh, tight on that and that it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we have this UN repertoire for privacy rights coming on April 25th. And that uh, he's going to investigate both the charges that apparently came to light in Cassandra Fairbeck's story about uh, Assange being subjected to full body scans within the embassy that he's living in, and mm -hmm. also Moreno's claims that his privacy was violated because the WikiLeaks had published these documents. So hopefully the uh, rapporteur will get to the bottom of both of those issues, and hopefully, dis if it's true, uh, dismiss Moreno's charge and confirm. Assange is charged that his privacy are, rights are being violated by the surveillance as well, I should mention. Mm -hmm. That's everywhere in that embassy, even in the kitchen. 
not in the bathroom, we were told by the head of the frontline club as who exited the embassy this morning. They allowed a visitor in there. Oh, that's, so, that's so kind of them. It really is. Uh, I hate to say that that's maybe where he should be meeting journalists. Um, <laughs> if you want to, I don't think they'd let you people in there. Yeah. No, it's well, very, yeah. I, I think it's important to remain vigilant. And, uh, you know, if this turns out to, uh, you know, not be the moment uh, of decision, uh, I have no criticism of sounding the alarm because it does no good to sound the alarm after the events have already occurred. That's right. And the sounding the alarm itself may have been why it didn't happen. We don't know yeah. for sure. That's very yeah. possible. Yeah. But that's why that has to be done. So um, you're not suggesting, Peter, that Donald Trump is responsible for corruption in Latin America, are you? Is that what you were saying before? I there was plenty of that before Donald Trump was probably even born. No, I think he is just uh, enabling and uh, encouraging um, the instincts of people who see him as a role model yeah. and uh, use his tactics. Uh, I mean, I haven't followed Moreno on Twitter, um, but <laughs> I, I can I only think, imagine that he uses it the way Trump does. I think uh, the best example of that might be Bolsonaro in Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, the tropical Trump, as he's been named, uh, who was openly praising Trump and Netanyahu, the first day after he was inaugurated, there was Netanyahu meeting with him. A picture of them shaking hands is about all you needed to know there. Yeah. Uh, and he's he went to Washington last month, Bolsonaro, and you know where the first place he went was Central Intelligence Headquarters. It was a brown bag lunch, you know, just, just a little casual thing. Just chatting. Yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't want to go to the White House. He didn't want to go to Congress first. He wanted to go to the CIA. Yeah. Uh, which apparently no Latin American leader had ever done openly, obviously, uh, because of this message that uh, that tells you something about the times we're living in. Well, and let's no let's remember that, you know, Dilma Rousseff, the uh, impeached president of Brazil, she got in Obama's face for tapping her phone. And we know the U.S. has had an outsized interest in uh, Brazil uh, 1965 forward. Well, no question about it. You don't do that. Uh, also, uh, getting in someone's face, um, the previous president of Christine, what was her name? The president of Argentina. Um, mm. She, at a UN well, Security Kirchner. Council meeting. Kirchner, like right. Kirchner, yeah, Kirchner. Uh -huh. yeah, Kirchner got in Obama's face live on TV in an open meeting of the UN Security Council. Uh, and was really, really going after him, and it was great to see. And that was the end of <laughs> Miss Kirchner as president of Argentina. Mm -hmm. Well, way, uh, yeah. I, I mentioned uh, Dan Kavalik a minute ago, who was the right. election observer in uh, Venezuela. His newest book, and I've got it on my shelf here somewhere, uh, is about American election interference in countries all over the world. And we know that uh, the uh, account that's embraced by the New York Times is 81 nations up through 2001. And Kabbalic profiles, uh, some of those that preceded 9-11 and uh, several since then. And uh, it's really interesting to uh, you know, revisit some of these elections, uh, coups, uh, covert operations that the U.S. has engaged in. And of course, it just slightly undermines our credibility when we claim outrage that foreign actors might try to play in our pond. Absolutely. And you don't read about those things in the New York Times, do you? Very often. Until yeah. 50 years later when the files are released and then there's all these apologies like Pinochet. Mm -hmm. We have Madeleine Albright and others apologizing for overthrowing Pinochet. Well, it's a little too late, isn't it? 50 yeah. years later. And um, this is why they want Julian Assange, because he's doing it in real time. We're getting to see what these people are doing while they're often still in power. And uh, that it makes him target number one. And he's apparently lived to see another day inside that embassy. Yeah. Well, and, and we still have this <clears throat> failure to take on 
the critical issues that create the need for WikiLeaks, that the US government engages in far too much secrecy. They declare secret things that are simply embarrassing or inconvenient, and this creates a whole uh, mechanism for uh, enforcement. And, uh, you know, we've seen very little uh, mainstream media support for Chelsea Manning, who is, you know, subjecting herself to another round of solitary confinement, uh, standing on principle. And I'd like to see some principled editorials and commentary, you know, uh, the only endorsement of release for Chelsea that I've seen came from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, among elected officials. And so, you know, we, we continue to have a problem uh, where the, the media is, is very selective about matters of principle and they operate mostly to defend their self-interest uh, not the, the greater good of the public interest. I think you're going to get Chloe barking in favor of uh, Chelsea Manning before you'll see the New York Times doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Joe, speaking of Chloe, I'm going to have to sign off here. I've got okay. a room full of people here, and we've got to start a show in a few minutes. Well, I appreciate you coming on again. Mm -hmm.